Thank you very much. All right. So our first question is, uh, what is your current age? I'm 66. All right. And what inspired you to join the Navy? Uh, I guess it would be my brother. My brother was in the Navy, and um, my dad asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I want to join the Navy. So when I became a senior, I went down to the recruiting office, and I signed up. Went on a delayed entry program for two months, and I went into service in July of 1972, and I went to boot camp down at Recruit Training Command San Diego, which was all right with me because in boot camp I became uh, I was chosen by my company commander to be uh, uh, RCP um, RP01, and that was pretty amazing to me because I had to go to all our classes. Me and another guy we had double time and all the time to class from where we were at. We worked in the battalion office. And that was a lot of fun. All right. So you, um, what other stories do you remember from boot camp? Oh, let's see. Um, I got sick while I was on the advanced training side. I got, uh, back then they call it a three-day measles. I mean, I got sick. I had a fever and stuff, but I still went to work. And then my uh, battalion commander, one of them came in and he goes, uh, what's the matter with you? And the other guy told him, I said, he's sick. He's burning up. So he came over and touched me and stuff. He goes, you just go ahead and sleep. And then there was a first class that came in and started yelling at me. And he turned around, tapped him on the shoulder and says, come here for a minute. And he chewed him out. He said, you leave that recruit alone. He's not feeling good. I told him to sleep. And he can sleep for however how long he needs to. So, All right. Uh, if you would do me a favor, please, and just remove your hat. Sure. Yeah, that'll help us some bit later. All right, thank you. Um, any other stories from Big Camp? Uh, well, the, the only one that really stands out is when uh, my company uh, graduated and stuff, I stood a barracks watch while they went over there. Uh -huh. And so I didn't gra graduate with my company. Mm -hmm. But I got to go on Liberty as soon as they got back, and my mom and dad were there, and I went and met them, and then we went out in San Diego. All right. So, now, did you go to an A school? No, I didn't. I tried to get into P and A school, but they wouldn't send me. All right. I was kind of short on my scores. Okay. So, after boot camp, um, did you go on uh, leave? Did you go home, or did you go to your next, your first duty station? I went home for two weeks, and I stayed with my mom and dad, and then I reported into my first ship, which was in Long Beach, and that my brother was on there, and I got brother duty with him. Okay. And we were in Long Beach for, I think, less than a year, and then we changed home ports to Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And we went over to Hawaii, and that was amazing that I got sent over there. I enjoyed staying in Hawaii was there, and then we deployed from there like six months later. And while we were deployed overseas, my brother left the ship, so I was on the ship, you know, without him, but that was okay. Mm -hmm. I got along with everybody, and when I was on board the ship, I was in the deck division. I had to do all the deck work and stuff like that, and then the weapons officer was looking for a yeoman, and my brother told him before I left, he goes... He wants to be a yeoman, so he pulled me down into the weapons office, and I was striking to be a yeoman. And while I was down there, just before my last year, when I left in 75, 74, I made third class. All right. Um, and what ship was that? That was the USS Bruton D-1086. All right. Um, what is that D-1086? It's Destroyer Escort. So just real briefly, describe what the ship's overall duties were. And then you can talk more about your specific duties. Um, but what does a destroyer escort do? It would go ahead. Um, it, it actually escorted like carriers and stuff. They would go first in, and then the carrier would follow. Like when we went through the San Bernardino Straits going to the Philippines, we went in first. But then uh, they switched off. Well, two escorts went first, then the carrier did. And we were trailing them. What? behind them. And then when you go through the straits, you have to 
go in the wake of the ship in front of you. So you can tell when it makes its turn. So when he made his turn, you just stayed in his wake and you made your turn following him. And that was an experience because I had to drive the ship. So you actually piloted the helm? Yes, I did. On the, uh, on the Britain? Yes, I enjoyed that. Okay. Um, so what um, you already described your duties as a yeoman. What was your general quarter station on the Bruton? Uh, tell the honest truth, I can't remember. That's okay. Now, how long would you serve on the Bruton and um, then describe your next duty station and how did you get there? Okay, from October of 72 to uh, May of 75. My next duty station was to recruit training command San Diego. And when I got there, they stuck, they put me over in the receiving and outfitting. That's where all the recruits come in and they get uh, put in the companies there. They send home all their clothes that they're not going to have or they can donate them. And while I was there, uh, the chief in charge, um, he was also a chief yeoman. And I got to know him real good. And then he moved around. He left Arno, went over to admin. Well, yeah, over to admin. And he requested to have me transferred over there too so I could work for him. Mm -hmm. And I went to a couple of different other divisions, but I finally I ended up in the admin office again with him. And then he retired. So okay. I was on my own for about a year. And I made second class. And then I got transferred to Naval Facility San Nicolas Island, Point Magoo, California. All right. Um, just to recap, when you made second class, what was the enlisted rank on that? E E5. E5. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So continue. And when I got to San Nicolas Island, my brother was there. I got brother duty again with him. And um, that was an experience. But when I made second class in November... Of 78, he made chief in 78. So that was a big thing for him and right. for me too. And then we stayed together for about six months and then he got transferred and I still worked in the admin office. And while I was there with for two and a half years, I took the E6 exam and I made, I made first class. Great. And I was put in charge of the admin office as ship secretary. And what ship was that? No, ship secretary. That's what the, that was the position that you feel on shore duty. Oh, okay. I, okay, not a problem. Yeah. All right. So, um, continuing on, um, at this time, were you uh, a chief select? No, I wasn't. I didn't become a chief select until I got to Washington, D.C. And um, after I got done with uh, San Nicolas Island, I went to, I got orders to shape Belgium. Okay. And I went there. I was only there a year, and then I got orders back to the states to the Pentagon in D.C. Really? Yeah. So you actually served time in the Pentagon. Yes. Um. So go back. Let's step, step back, though. Uh, talk about some. What was your duties in Belgium? In Belgium, they had two sides: the international side and the U.S. side. Mm -hmm. So I check into the U.S. side, and they sent me over to the international side, and I worked in um, readiness division. And the officer in charge was a Canadian colonel, mm -hmm. and I had a German staff sergeant working in there, uh, uh, a U.K. RIN, a female, and I believe I had an Italian guy there, and I was the chief in charge of them. Mm -hmm. And so I was down there in that division for about about four months. And and the colonel, he asked me, he says, you got a house yet? I said, no. He says, go, go get a house and come back when you find a house. And I just happened to run into a guy that was an Army guy. He was getting transferred. And I saw him over at housing. He says, you looking for a house? I go, yeah. He says, I have one. He says, it's up in Lund's. I can get you, get it for you. So he told the guy, and I said, yeah, I'll take it. And I didn't, without even looking at it, I took it. And it was a nice little house, and it was owned by a, Bel a Belgian man. And he had his farm probably about two miles down the road. And uh, so I took my rent down to him. And that was an experience for me because they spoke 
a Flemish Belgium. Right. With something like French or something like that. And what year was this? This was in 1982 to 83. Okay. That I was there. All right. All right, so after that, you said you were stationed at the Pentagon? Yes. I what were your quick. duties there? I went to Operation Readiness Division, and I was in there for eight months, and then I heard there was an opening up on uh, 908 Division. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed for that, and I got selected to go in there and run that, and be in charge of that office of the military people in there. They had civilians also working in there. And when I was there, I took the chief's exam once, and I didn't make it and didn't get selected. The following year, in 83, I took the chief's exam, and I made it. Got selected. All right. And where did you, uh, now that you uh, select chief, what is the process of actually jumping from E6 to E7 or Navy chief? I mean, that puts you on heel nine, man. You go mm -hmm. up. But uh, it was an experience. I had to carry my charge book around with me. And the guy that was my sponsor, I knew him from San Nicolas Island. He was already a chief. And he worked down in the mail room, so he sponsored me. And while we were there, I got to know the career counselor there uh, in the Pentagon or Op Nav Division. And one day he asked me, he called me up, he says, hey, you want to go with me up to Bupers? And I said, yes, I would. So I went up there with him, and he said, don't forget your book. Well, I took it with me. So while we were going up there, we looked. At, we went to a couple offices, and then he says, come on, I'm going to take you to see the uh, Master Chief of the Navy. I said, you're kidding me. He goes, no. Is he in? He goes, yeah. He'll be glad to meet you. As soon as we started going to his office, he stepped out. And uh, Chief Harisco told him, he says, he says, good morning there, Master Chief. He says, how are you doing? He says, I'm doing fine. And he says, and who is the young man that you have with you here? He says, this is uh, Navy Chief Selectee Lloyd Holona. And he says, welcome aboard. And you don't know how proud I was of that. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, are you going to offer your book to me? I go, oh, yes, sir, Master Chief. And I gave him my... My charge book, and he signed it for me. He wrote in it and signed it. So I do have a signature from one of the Master Chiefs of the Navies in my book. And I still have that book today. That's impressive. Yes. All right. So um, what else did you do at the D.C. station? Uh, I just worked in Op Nav uh, 98. I worked for an admiral. Well, at that time, they were uh, called Commodores, a one-star. And I worked for him until I left in uh, 85. And, but he was, a, he was a, a good man to work for. He was, he was a colored, colored man and he was nice, real nice to his staff. And he would call me in, he would go, gee, yell. And the secretary would say, what'd you do? I said, I don't know, I'm going to go and find out. He would just call me in and says, close the door. So I closed the door and he goes, come on over and sit down. He says, We'll take your anchor cloth. I'll take my star off. He says, I just want to talk. Man to man. He says, I just want to talk. He says, I'm getting tired of this business right now. So we'd sit there for about 20, 30 minutes just talking, offering me coffee and stuff. And that's the way we work. And then when we got done, I opened the door and I said, have a nice day, Commodore. And then I go back to work. Right. And he invited us over for to his house for a party. And it was for just the officers. And one of the officers says, I heard you got invited to the party. I go, yeah. He says, who invited you? I said, the one star. He did? I go, yeah. I said, if you have a problem with that, you can go talk to him about it. He goes, nah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you're now chief select, but you do have to go through some training to actually get that anchor or... Uh, that's the Navy term for the insignia of the Chiefs. Yeah, you go through to uh, move to E seven. So yeah, go ahead and tell us about that. Yeah, here. you go. You go. You take a couple of classes and stuff, and you got you know you got to go through and learn how to be a leader. And you get up before the class, and you guys discuss something, and you don't let it get out of hand. And then all you do is just, you know 
when you're done, you say, that's it. You guys did good. And hopefully I did good. But then you got uh, initiation, which is done in September. Usually around the 16th of September is when they do initiation. Our initiate, initiation got pushed until the 18th of September because we had to go down to Indian Head and get initiated down there. But once you get initiated, you're good to go. I had fun going through my initiation, and there wasn't anything they could you know, do to me to humiliate me or anything like that. It was something I worked for, and I was glad I made it. And I don't regret none of it today. <laughs> okay, so talk about uh, the initiation itself. And also, why mid-September? Is that a Navy custom? Yes. The 16th of September is when they actually hold the initiations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just had to go through initiation. Uh, don't think I'm supposed to really say what we do there. That's fine. But it's all it's all in fun. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing there that they're going to do to hurt you, humiliate you, or anything like that. It's all fun. And there's it's nothing but chiefs, master chiefs, senior chiefs. They're all there. And usually you get uh, the command master chief of the Navy. He'll Sometimes he'll come down. But you get, you know, chiefs that you knew. They find, You can let them know that you made it. And they usually try to come for your initiation. And I actually had... Two girls that worked for my brother that were chiefs. One was a senior chief, the other one was a chief. And she goes, I thought that was you because I met them when I was just a senior. Mm -hmm. And uh, they go, we're sorry to hear about your brother. And I said, thank you very much. Okay. So after you uh, did your chief initiation and you're now an E7, mm -hmm. what was your uh, first duty station as a Navy chief? I got orders to that research ship, USS and Bowditch, and I had no idea what it did. Mm -hmm. But I was going to, I had orders to Dakar, Africa to meet it over there, because they thought it was going across. But then they sent a tele, uh, message back saying that we'll put, send them to Barbados, we'll be there in 10 days. So I had to stay at Northport, Virginia for 10 days, and I stayed just the barracks watch once a week. And then I flew down from there down to Barbados and met the ship. And one of the chiefs down there met me at the airport. And that was an exciting tour too. Well, what exactly did that ship do? It researched the ocean floor for different levels of depthness and all that on the ocean floor. And um, once we got across, they brought me all the transcripts and everything. And I typed all that up into a, a, probably about a 15-page letter. And we had to send that off to St. Louis, Mississippi, to them, our boss. Mm -hmm. And once that was done, I just took care of uh, people coming to check in. I was uh, the admin, uh, admin assistant and the personnel officer while I was on there. So I had to know both the officer and the enlisted records, which I already did know that. Okay. Now, after, if I'm reading your bio correctly, after the, um, the Valvich, you were, uh, you got orders for USS New Jersey. Yes. What was that, your reaction when you saw that you were going to be on a famed Iowa class battleship? You should have seen the smile on my face when I saw, got them ordered. And I couldn't believe it. And I said, I ain't out of here yet and there yet. And uh, I got 45 days leave, and then uh, after I left the Bowditch and got back home, I was on leave probably about 15 days, and the ship sec from the New Jersey, he called my called my at home and said, um, I need you to check in if you would, please. And I told him, I said, sir, I said, I haven't even got a house for my family yet. I said, I'm still dealing with Navy housing to get it. And he says, you go down there tomorrow and I'll see what I can do. Well, I actually went down that day and they said, we have a house for you. And I told him, I, said, I need to get a house for my family because I'm going to deploy in another 20 days. And the lady, she bent over backwards to get me that house. And I got my household goods delivered. I was home with them until I had to report in the ship. And I did. And um, my journey began. Okay. So um, 
where did you meet the New Jersey and what was your reaction for the very first time you saw her? I was just amazed how big she was and long she was and I met her in Long Beach, California. And when I drove down there, I had my wife drop me off at the end of the pier and I told her, I said, I'll see you at four today. And I walked down and I was just amazed how high she was, how, how she looked. And I just couldn't believe that I was getting put up, you know, reporting the board. So I got, went up the gangway. I requested permission to come aboard and I turned around, saluted the ensign got on board and they said, yes, Chief, I'm reporting as the new Chief for Admin. So they called up there and my leading petty officer came out to meet me and take me to the ship, take me to the office. Mm -hmm. His name was Petty Officer Plowman. All right. Now, let's talk about uh, your um, everyday duties on board the ship. And you work close to Captain Glenn, uh, Walter Glenn, correct? Yes. All right. So talk about your regular duties on the ship. And uh, by the way, is this the desk you use uh, behind me? This one was here when I moved it. One, one <laughs> similar to that. It had uh, three drawers in it, and it was gray. They were haze gray. Right. And um, my, my desk was in the middle of the office up there uh, mm -hmm. facing the bulkhead. And the desk next next to me was sideways against the bulkhead, and that was the ship secretary. Right. I was the admin chief, the leading chief for admin, and I everything that was typed in there I saw. Mm -hmm. I proofread it, and if it was wrong, I gave it back to whoever typed it and told them to fix it. And then if it was okay, I pass all the paperwork to the ship second. He did the same thing. And it usually got through. Maybe I missed one or two letters or something. But other than that, it went through just fine. All right. So what other duties did you have in that role? Uh, mail. When we went and picked up mail, I went through all the mail that came in for the New Jersey. I opened it all up. I looked at it. And then I would assign who was responsible to answer the, uh, give an answer to that piece of correspondence. And I put it on a route slip, send that out. And um, I would have... Other people in there say, I need you to take this down to them. I said, there's no action, but it's something that belongs to them instead of, uh, you know, up here. I said, the, the commander down there can take it up to the CEO and let him see it. And I just, and I date stamped everything that we got in. When we received it, who has action on it, stuff that I wanted the captain to see, I would put a routing stamp on it and put check marks who it goes to and who's supposed to retain it. But I also looked through it to make sure there wasn't a report that had to be due so I can put it on the sign due date to get something back. All right. Now, uh, did you have a general quarter station on board? Yes, I did. It was down in the cruise mess. I was down there with the medical officer, and I just made sure that everybody that was down in there was taken care of, you know, that they were at the right place. And what they did was that they were called away for a medical assistant, and we would send them out. They weren't medical off people. They were people who went to either help with a stretcher or whatever and tell them where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. And that's um, was that's uh, near the ship's chapel is the one? Yes. Station? It okay. was the chaplain that was down there with us, too. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk about um, life after your duty. Um, did you have to stand watches? Oh, yes, I did. And where were some of your watches? I always stood on the forward quarter deck. And on my duty days, you know, I worked all day and I worked at night until midnight. I was getting things done in the office and looking through my people's desk to make sure they're not hiding any correspondence. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I would go to bed and I would always put in a call to have the messenger of the watch come and wake me up about an hour before I was supposed to go on watch so I could shower and get dressed. And then I stood the forward quarter deck watch. And I, when they had the petty officer to watch switch, he got and he would come to me and he says, I'm assuming the duties as petty officer to watch. I said, very well, carry on. And then he would go fill out the log and I would look at it after he got done doing it to make sure he filled it out. And then we passed the general quarter. I've always, I always asked for the four to eight in the morning. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Now, um, so let's talk about what you did in your spare time. Doesn't sound like you left yourself a lot of spare time, but what were some of your hobbies, the activities on the ship? Um, what did you What did you do when you were unwinding? Um, I found out they had a ship's uh, softball team, and so I asked us who's in charge of the softball team, and they told me who it was, and I went over and I said, you know, do you guys need any more players? They said, sure, Chief. So, you know, I tried out, and I made the team, and then the guy that was uh, running the team, he left, and they asked, who's going to take, take over the team? I said, I'll do it. So I, I took over the softball team. And then I, you know, I had I had some good ball players. I had about three guys that were tall, skinny, and they could hammer the ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went, we just about went to about every tournament there was on uh, Long Beach Naval Base, and we came out on top of that. So you have some trophies. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, yeah. They might still be on the mess deck, or if we did have some in the. Uh, I saw one. You saw one. I saw one of them. I said that. I got that one. I said that was for Admiral Glenn. Great. All right. So let's uh, talk about um, your close uh, working relationship with Captain Walter Glenn. Um, type of person was he? Um, what was it like to work for him directly and indirectly? Anything like that? He was a very nice man to work for. I enjoyed going up to him and talking to him. I wasn't scared of him. And um, he he told me one time, he says, you can ask me anything, Chief. He says, it's about me, personal questions. He says, but you, know, you can ask me about anything. And I said, same here, sir. I said, I'm here to serve you. I said, is there anything I can do for you? You just let me know and I'll get it done. And he said, oh, very well. He says, that's the kind of chief I'm looking for to run my office. And uh, ship secretary, I enjoyed working with both, you know, I think I had three of them in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, they were both very nice men that I enjoyed working with. And the second one, he helped me get orders when I was getting ready to go to shore duty. They wanted to send me back overseas, and I said, this master is still just messing with me. He wants to send me overseas. He says, let me see what I can do. And then for, I got a call one day on board the ship, and the guy says, this is Lieutenant so-and-so from Bupers, the Yeoman Department. He says, I uh, heard you were trying to get orders. Uh, and I go, yes, sir. He goes, where do you want to go? I said, San Diego. He says, we're at San Diego. I said, North Island, San Diego, whatever. And he says, okay. I said, but command, I said, Master Chief so-and-so said, he said, the only thing they had was overseas. He says, he no longer works here. We got rid of him. And I had my orders to HSL 43 in San okay. Diego. Well, before we go, before we go to that duty station, I definitely have more questions about uh, your time on the battleship with your Okay. The, you did... Uh, tell me on the side that you got to witness a 16-inch gun from practically the top of the ship. Yeah, that was up. Can you describe that? Was that the first time you heard the guns fire during a training? That was the first time we went out for an exercise. Mm -hmm. And the ship secretary told me, he says, Oh, Chief, you get to observe your first gun shoot tomorrow. You can observe it up on the old 11 level. He says, I'll have Petty Officer Palm and take you up to the stack. And I said, okay, that's fine. So when we got ready to go, he, he gave me, he goes, here are some earplugs. He said, you'll need them. Mm -hmm. He says, very loud. I said, okay, so we went all the way up, and I was sitting, well, I'm looking around, and I go, man, this is a view, a good view. And then he says, he was the CEO's talker for gun shoots. He says, listen, when you hear beep, 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 it's probably about two or three seconds before that gun will fire. And so I did, and he goes, when it does, he says, spread your legs apart and hold on. I said, okay. I said, don't you be lying to me. He goes, no, I'm not one lying to you, Chief. And sure enough, I heard the beep, beep, beep. I looked down, and then I looked at it, and then it went off. I mean, that was a big percussion that just threw me back. And I was like this, holding mm -hmm. on. And then I came back like that, and I looked Man, that is something. And 
I was just amazed how it felt and how it looked. And for the record, the uh, beep, beep, beep is known as the Fire Salvo line. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So were you part of the uh, Battleship Battle Group during um, any of the Pacific exercises? Yes. Yes, and we were. What was that like? A lot of at sea time and stuff like that, but I really did enjoy to get to see all the ships escort the carrier through wherever we went. And we were usually alongside it, we never went behind it. We stayed right with it, and all, just all the smaller ships, like the frigates and stuff like that, would be ahead, and we just stayed in them. I never had to drive the battleship, I wish I could have. Yeah. Drove it. Okay. Now, was this the uh, battle? Was this the Pacific exercise that did not have carriers, or were there carriers? I involved? think that's when they went to Australia. I don't think they had a carrier. With them. Okay. I was off the ship. I left in August of '88. Okay. So you did not go to the um, Australia bison. No, I did. I'm. A, I should have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talking to some of your fellow sailors on other interviews, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, they had a great time. Yeah. Now, did you cruise off the coast of uh, Seoul, South Korea during the Olympics? That yes, was also we, in 88. Yes, we were actually in Seoul, Korea when we pulled in. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it was just amazing. It rained, though, and we were all dressed out. And on the uh, forward quarter deck, the awning, the water went down and it started to sink. So I had to get a broom and push up on the water. Like I had a room a set of whites mm -hmm. and uh, shoes, but it, it was something. Yeah, you'll be glad to know we still have to do that even as a museum. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, let's talk about some of your uh, ports of call. And then just uh, tell us some of your ports of call. And then you can talk about like one of your favorites and what why it was one of your favorites. Uh, let's see if I can remember them. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed Korea while we were there. We had to anchor out and take a boat in. But that was something for me to be there for my first time. We when we went over on our my first deployment with the New Jersey, we had a we had some midshipmen on there. And they were getting off in Korea. And so we had to go into Korea and go to the personnel office there and do make all their flight arrangements and get them tickets and stuff and do that. The chief personnel man and myself went over. I took care of the officers and he took care of the enlisted ones. And we were over there probably all day. And then after we got done, had the tickets, I said, let's go get something to eat. Let's go to the chief's club. So we went over to Chief's Club and got dinner and stuff, and then we went back to the ship and got them guys out of there the mm -hmm. the next day. All right. Um, oh, and Hong Kong. All right. Hong yeah. Kong was another one I enjoyed. I enjoyed Hong Kong. The last time I was in Hong Kong was in 1973, and I got two tattoos there. They're both on my arms, and... I went over there because I was going to get one more tattoo that I saw there, and they still had it. I won't tell you what it is, but uh, the night before we pulled in, they put all tattoo parters off limit to all military personnel. And I go, man. So, was I that just, uh, why you were on the Bruton? Or yeah, part of when, the battle? I, okay. when I was on the Bruton. All right. Now, did you ever go through the Panama Canal on the New Jersey? No, I didn't. All right. Did you ever go through the Panama Canal and use your ships? No. All right. Uh, did you ever cross the equator? Yes. And you are a shellback currently? Yes, I am. I became a shellback on the uh, Bowditch. Okay. When we were out there, we they say we're going across the equator, and it was all you uh, polywogs. You know, the lieutenant, the XO was a polywog. I mean, a shellback. I mean, he got us up like at 4:30 in the morning. We had it. We started, mm -hmm. but it, it was it was something to experience, and it was the same, almost like a, uh, a chief's initiation. It's initiation you go through. It's all meant in fun, not to humiliate you or anything like that. It's just 
a lot of fun for everybody, and I really did enjoy it. Okay. Now, um, after any other stories from the New Jersey that you remember, or like to uh, share? Oh, I have a lot of memories of uh, all the, the chiefs that I knew on board, and I became real good friends with them and everything like that. I did really enjoy that with them. Mm-hmm. And the command master chief was a real good friend of mine, and uh, he had a boat over there in the marina, and he would come in and he says, they called me Indian. He go, Indian? You go, what? He says, let's go to lunch. He said, all right. So I tell the ship, so I'm going to lunch, I'll be back. He says, all right. And we started going out. So we're going to Chief's Club. He goes, no, we're going over to my boat. So we go over to his boat and he make lunch for us. And we sit there and eat and look at it. See, it was nice. All right. Now, um, when you did you work also for Captain Tax? Yes, I did. And uh, what was he like? Or what was some of the similarities and contrast to Captain Glenn? Oh, excuse me. Douglas Tax, Captain Douglas Tax, yeah. for the record. Go ahead. He was, I would put them both in the same categories I described for uh, Admiral Glenn. Mm-hmm. And um, he was a very nice young man, I mean, a man to, to work for. And he did the same thing to me. He says, Chief, you got anything you want to get off your chest? Ask me about, you know, it's personal or whatever. He says, I'll be glad to tell you. And I said, Thank you, sir. And I said, I, I said, there's, if you need anything, just let me know and I'll get it done for you, no matter what it is. I said, you need help, you know, when, if you got to take something off the ship, I said, I'd be glad to help you with that. All right. So after the New Jersey, um, did you, well, before you left the New Jersey, did you have any kind of gathering or is there a tradition to go from a battleship to another ship? Had a short goodbye. The Chiefs took me over to the Chiefs Club uh, the day before I got transferred. Mm-hmm. And um, they were getting ready to deploy when I got transferred. I left the day day before they deployed. They took me over there and they to the Chiefs Club and got me about half in the bag. But they gave me my plaque over there and they gave me my pictures and, you know, say goodbye. The goodbyes, and I said, I wish I was going with you guys. They said, You still can. And I said, No, that's okay. <laughs> but I do miss them all, and I do miss the ship. All right. And so, what was your next duty station after the New Jersey? And uh, what was the mode of travel, or how did you get to that station? Uh, mode of travel is private vehicle because I just went up the coast to um, uh, Point Magoo, California. Mm-hmm. And it was a naval facility, San Nicolas Island, which was 60 miles off the coast of California. We took a plane from the air base there on a Monday, and we came back on a Friday. Okay. And then when I was there, I was in charge of the softball team. So we played on Tuesday night, so I came home Tuesday nights, and then I left Wednesday morning after our games. Okay. But it was it was a nice little island, and I really enjoyed it out there, too. All right, and let me go back real quick. Uh, what year are we in now? When did what year did you leave the New Jersey, and what station or what port were you in? That was uh, 1988. We were in Long Beach. Long Beach, okay. Yeah, and before my actual transfer date, which was in September, I went to the training uh, the group, Long Beach uh, Naval Group there. Mm-hmm. And I was the, the, I guess, a TAD officer or something. I can't remember, really. But for just about two and a half weeks, I was there. Okay. Now, uh, describe your duties at the uh, next station. Uh, um, am I saying this right? HSL 43? Yes, HSL 43. All right. So talk about your duties there. Uh, I reported in, and I was in charge of the admin office there. I uh, worked for the captain and the XO, and a uh, lieutenant who was the admin officer was a female. She was very nice, and you know, she's. I met everybody that worked in the office. I sat down with her, talked to her for about an hour and a half. I asked her how she wanted the office ran, and she says, That's up to you, Chief. 
you set the tone how you want that office to operate. She goes, I'll back you up 100%. She goes, I'm not going to tell you how to run your office. because You've been doing it a long time, longer than I have. So I did. And a lot of, you know, I had arguments with officers, they, they, pilots, because they used to come from down below and they always wait until the end of the month to do their, their qual reports. And they would come in and throw my people off their computers. And I saw that one day and I go, what the heck's going on? So I walked out there and I said, excuse me, sir. I said, what are you doing? He says, I need to use your computer. I got to do my call reports. I said, when's it due? He says, tomorrow. And I said, you do this how long? He says, a week. I said, you can either take it out yourself or I'm going to pull it out. He says, no, wipe your disc clean. He says, you better not. I pulled it out, wiped it clean. And he says, he started yelling at me and stuff like that. And I said, well, you don't come up here and throw my people off their computer from their desk. This is my office. If you want something done, you come and ask me. Now get out of my office. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, well, I just did. There's the door. Hit it. And then I went in and I told her and she goes, I heard it. She goes, I back you up 100%. And she goes, I'll go let the EXO know. And the X, she went in to tell him. And he goes, I heard it. <laughs> and they both went in to tell his CEO. And he goes, I heard it. <laughs> he says, Chief didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. He said, he handled it just right. He says, them pilots down there, they know there's when they're supposed to turn them in. They can't wait till the last minute. And sure enough, they anybody who want to use a computer, if I had a free one, I let them use it. Mm -hmm. So you did all that, but still kept your military decorum. Yes, I did. Yeah, it's amazing how that works. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else about that duty station? I didn't want to leave it, but they, my billet was eliminated. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to get transferred to... I forgot where I was going to get... Oh, I was... I wasn't, I was getting transferred, but I didn't know where. And another chief on there, he was at a helo squadron and he was going over to the mainland. And um, he asked, he called me up, he says, Hey, you want to do a swap? And I said, Sure. He says, I'm at HSL 35. I'm leaving here and I'm going to the supply center over at 32nd Street. He says, But I don't want it. He says, because my wife's working here at, on NAS. And why not? So I went over and I checked in. Uh, the CEO says, I got an admin inspection coming up in 45 days. He says, I want to pass. I said, I'll pass you on it. Because I took 43 through the same admin. Mm -hmm. And he said, you get me through it, you got your transfer over to FTG. So... I said, okay. I got him through it. He stood by his word. I was gone the next day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what was your duty station? Or what was your duties at your next stage? At Fleet Training Group, what it was is it's a training team that goes out to ships that are getting to, ready for pre-deployment, and they are run through all their tests, their battle state uh, battle stations, and everything that has to do with that ship. They go out and evaluate them the whole week. Come back. They go out like three weeks. And then at the end of the third week, they give the CEO his report of what goes on. They come in every Friday and stuff like that. I was in charge of the admin office, and I just made sure the people that I worked with me, we took care of everything there. Now, what years was it? Where are you at these stages? It was at from 80, 89 to 92. Okay. And um, I didn't have to stand any duty over there. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was told is because I was assistant admin officer. And the assistant admin officer does not stand duty. And it was in the bylaws. And there was a lot of chiefs that were pissed because they were uh, standing duty. And they complained about me not standing duty. And the command master chief came up and he talked to the admin officer and he was straightened out on that. And then they was wondering why I was parking the assistant admin officer spot, which was right next to the building. <laughs> they were told 
He's the assistant admin officer. He's got a parking spot. So, I'm now during that time, uh, if I understood correctly, your your station would observe naval ships in preparation for deployment. Yeah, they would okay. go through training with them. Were any of those ships training for Desert Shield or Desert Storm? Yes, there was a few of them on. A lot of every one of them that was going getting pre-deployed were going through training and stuff. And we got messages that saying they wanted a chief yeoman on one of them. So I put my papers in. I got turned down. Mm -hmm. I got turned down twice to go. To go to? Yeah, I wanted to go. To I, yeah, I said, I want to go. Yeah. And I got turned down. Where? Were any of the ships that you knew of that were doing these exercises would it happen to be the Wisconsin the battleship USS Wisconsin at the time? I I can't recall. Okay, I was just curious. All right. Um, when uh, what was your uh, next duty station after that? Called retirement. Okay. <laughs> so where uh, when and where did you get out of the Navy? Or you? Excuse me. You retired from the Navy. I'll make uh, sure we get it I right. retired from Fleet Training Group on uh, July 31st, 1992. All right. Now, this next question is just um, talk about your post Navy life, um, your family, what you're doing professionally, where did you settle, things like that. Well, once I retired from the Navy, I told my wife, I said, I want to. I said, I want to live in Law and Hartville. And she was, that's where she's from. Mm -hmm. And she goes, you do? I go, yeah. And then she goes, okay. And uh, we were getting ready. Oh, before that, um, she says, well, let me think about it. Because she wanted to live in San Diego. Mm -hmm. and we, had, we had a house there. And then her brother called and said, if you want to see mom alive, you need to come home. She goes, we're moving back to Ohio. And I said, okay. So I put my stuff in storage for a year and then we moved back but you know we lived with her in her little trailer and the land that she had that was on she gave that to her to my wife her daughter mm -hmm. the farm next door is where my wife was born she sold the farm when her husband died in 1972 and on the other side of her her brother lived there and he sold his house so I said, you know, I tried to buy that house, but they told me that I couldn't get it because I wasn't here working. I said, well, I'm in the Pentagon, so I'm getting paid. I said, you know, we'll take care of that. But they turned me down for that. So we, after I retired, we bought a house, a manufactured home, and we put it on that property. Mm -hmm. And her mother lived with us for an additional six years. Oh, no, I say ten. Mm -hmm. Ten years she lived with us. Okay. Sadly, to say we lost her after that. But uh, I was coaching the softball team there, my nephew's softball team. And I stayed with them for about a year, and then I was like, nah, that's about it. I can't handle it anymore. Because they were just not right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I went to work for mostly retail. And my last job that I had was in. Uh, a warehouse for Wolf Enterprises. He deals with uh, copiers. People who lease copiers, and when the lease ends, they turn them into us. Our the trucks go out, and pick them up, and bring them back. I was in receiving, and I took care of all that receiving out, shipping out on copiers. They would sell them, and we would get them ready to go. We send copiers overseas, and to sell them. And then I got uh, sick in 2016. I got a disease called cold abutment. I had to retire. Mm -hmm. I was with them for 11 years. And I didn't uh, think I had to go to the doctor a lot and stuff and get treatment, chemo treatment. And um, it finally went into remission about almost two years ago. And I'm still in remission right now. Oh, right but I get a once a month treatment up at the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, how about uh, kids, grandkids? I have two kids, a uh, boy and a girl uh, named Troy, my daughter named Candace. I have uh, three grandkids. It's um, Trevor, that's my son, boy. And my daughter has two, Allison and Dylan. Mm -hmm. We have another one that um, 
My son got married to his, to her mom. My son got married and her the lady had a girl. And she knew her. She was two. And my son's the only one that she recognizes as her dad. Mm -hmm. She's, she calls him dad. Because she lives with her grandmother right now. But we adopted her as a, a grandchild. Oh, that's great. All right. So um, this is the first time you've been back to New Jersey. Since yes, it is. Embarking. All right. And so describe what it was like coming up the pier and seeing her again. I said she still looks the same, and I was proud I served the whole day. Mm -hmm. And um, what impact did the Navy have on your life? It helped. It helped me a lot. It helped me how to lead people, be a manager, my self-respect, how to treat other people, how to respect them. And I learned a lot while I was in the Navy. All right. And our last question is more of an open-ended legacy question, because this interview will probably be seen by historians, um, students in the future. What message would you like to leave for future generations from now until then? I would like to leave them with, um, if you get the urge to join the service, any branch of the service, do it. You won't regret it. It's something for, that you need to experience, and I think you'll enjoy it. Whatever you do, you know, in the service, whatever job you get, I think you will just love it, and you'll meet different people from all over. You go to different countries, you see people there, and when you come back home, you can compare their culture with ours, and you do learn a lot. So I hope you take that and enjoy it. All right. Anything else you'd like to say before we close out? I'm just happy I came back to see the ship in New Jersey. I enjoyed my time on there. And we're happy to have you back. Oh, thank you. All right. That, thank you for your service and taking you time to join us. This concludes our interview. My name is Angela Pizzullo. I am the manager of the Oral History Program on board the Battleship New Jersey in Camden, New Jersey. Today is Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. Our interview guest was Lloyd Alona from Hartville, Illinois, Ohio. This recording and any transcripts, abstracts, or indexes made from the recordings will be stored in the Oral History Department of the Battleship New Jersey, the Library of Congress's Veterans History Project, and the New Jersey State Library System. All recordings will be made available to writers, researchers, teachers, and historians. And this is Angelo Pizzullo signing off.